Okay, just to double check, I've shared my screen. Can you see it? Yep, it's coming through well. Yep. All right, so uh, here we're at the top of the hour. Um, I've got uh, recording going so that we can post this up afterwards. Um, Alan has uh, shared for everybody in the uh, chat window the link to the document. Uh, we'll spam it again a time or two more as people join in. Make sure everybody has that. We'd invite you to jump on board on that with us, uh, sign in, um, help us keep notes in there. Um, we have uh, Greg from uh, UW Madison who's going to uh, lead our conversation today and cover uh, uh, Condor philosophy, uh, high throughput computing um, that uh, UW Madison is uh, well versed in. And uh, uh, we'll go ahead and turn things over to him. I'll just remind everybody to keep yourself muted in the Zoom channel unless you're asking questions. If you've got a question, feel free to unmute and ask, or feel free to ask in the chat. and. Uh, Keep an eye on that and uh, keep Greg aware when questions show up. But uh, otherwise, we'll turn things over to Greg and uh, go from there. Thank you. So uh, I'm glad the way you described this uh, as, a, as a conversation and not a presentation, because this is kind of a, a conversation we'd like to have with people, not just up, us uh, up on our philosophical, philosophical high ground, uh, telling people how it's going to be, but we want to to start these conversations about kind of the way we think and uh, we want to learn about the way other people think and and really have it to be conversation not just a, a presentation so uh, at a high level uh, things that I'd like to talk about today are um, the whys of Condor or HD Condor and and high throughput in general not this isn't going to be a talk about how to set knobs or uh, what does what or how to how to make it go fast or go slower or how to control policy or like that. It's, it's mainly about the, the, the whys of Condor and the, and the whys of, of high throughput computing. Now, uh, everyone kind of knows that I think that, that HD Condor is a distributed batch system. And a lot of times when you start talking about big distributed systems, the first thing people talk about are, are the bits and bytes. We need a, an exaflop system or we need uh, microsecond latency on our networks or we need this many cores or this much storage. But that's not really where we want to start from. Uh, we kind of want to start from a different place when we think about what kind of systems we're building. Uh, we want to start with, with people, um, not machines, but with people, because people have problems. And our goal is to solve some of the problems that uh, real people have. Now, this is a picture of our happy undergraduates. Uh, I guarantee you this picture was not taken today. Uh, but these aren't the kind of people that uh, we're really focusing on. We're focusing on uh, researchers on campus uh, that have research-related computational problems. Some of these problems may be something like this, where uh, a researcher has three years worth of computation to do, but wants to be done uh, a little more quickly than that. Or uh, maybe down the road, often we see that um, a researcher has access to enough computation to publish, but maybe not to revolutionize their field. And one thing we really want to do is to provide uh, qualitative change uh, in the research that, that computing enables, not just quantitative change, not to do a little bit more, but to change the actual quality of research results. A typical problem a researcher like this may have is that uh, their jobs aren't all the same. They need to describe them in, in different ways. Uh, and we have lots of researchers on, on campus and, and across the United States that have problems like this. But uh, our chemistry student here isn't the only person with problems. Uh, this here is uh, Eric Wilcox, who happens to be our, our dean of our School of Letters and Science, who is, I think, my boss's boss's boss. And uh, sadly, he's got problems too. So, for example, uh, a big problem that he may worry about is, um, uh, is he's investing through the campus's money uh, a fair amount of resources for, for computation, for research computing, and uh, he wants to make sure that that money is well spent. Uh, 
Um, he may have other concerns too, uh, like fairness uh, or even lack of fairness. For example, he may want to think that he may want to decree that if there's a very important group on campus, that uh, fairness goes out the window for a little bit. And what high throughput computing does in general um, is deal with the constraints that go in both directions and tries to manage these constraints uh, as best as possible. Now, managing these constraints is, is very difficult in general, and to make it even worse, uh, the real world isn't even this simple. Um, we have lots and lots of scientist users with lots of conflicting demands and, and lots of aggregate demands, and we don't just have one resource provider or one person providing uh, money for resources. We have a lot. So that makes this uh, problem uh, much more difficult. And because we have all these people with all these different requirements, uh, we think of this as a distributed problem. Now, a lot of people might think it's distributed because we use more than one computer, and that's kind of true in a legalistic sense, but it's really distributed because we have distributed people, people with different requirements uh, in different departments with, with different wants and needs. And our goal is to somehow uh, satisfy all these constraints, or maybe satisfy most of these constraints uh, as well as possible. Clearly, the problem in general is very much over-constrained, so we can't keep everyone happy all the time, uh, but we can do our best with, with most of the people and think about who's the, the most important to, to satisfy first. So if I had to distill the Condor philosophy um, down to one pithy slide, I think it would be something like this. So we want to reliably run uh, as much work as possible uh, on as many machines as possible, subject to all these constraints. And while the constraints is sort of the first order of business, the rest kind of goes in that order. Uh, we want to do it reliably, we want to run as much work, and uh, we want to use as many machines as possible. So we want to reliably run as much work as possible on as many machines as possible. Now, we talk about this philosophy a lot, um, and this is kind of the high throughput computing philosophy, but this is a very user focused view of the philosophy that we talk about jobs and work. Um, there's another side of this, um, this philosophy, which is really a dual. Um, it's the administrator's view. Um, and you can think of high throughput computing as kind of a user centric uh, view on this, this approach to the world. But the administrators or the machine's owner's view uh, would be high utilization computing. So the administrator's goal is to maximize machine utilization over some long period of time. So if an administrator has spent a lot of money or maybe a lot of time getting an allocation, or maybe they're leasing machines in the cloud or getting from other reasons, or getting machines the uh, other mechanisms, we want to make sure that those machines are, um, are always busy because they're depreciating like crazy. So we purchased them for a reason. We want to make sure that they're, uh, for whatever reason, in, in whatever way, uh, advancing the needs uh, of the campus or, or of the organization. So to paraphrase uh, Alec Baldwin, the ABCs of high throughput computing are always be computing. Now, there's kind of an unstated assumption under this, and that is that your work uh, can be broken up into a bunch of independent jobs. Um, and the smaller the jobs, uh, the better. So you can run them in as many places as possible. We also assume that you can use files uh, as your inner process communication mechanisms, and that any dependencies you have can be specified maybe as a DAG uh, of independent jobs. Um, now we understand that this is not the MPI model, and maybe it doesn't work for every single scientific or, or research problem out there, but our experience uh, at UW on campus and across the OSG has been that it works for a large majority uh, of the scientific uh, and research needs out there. And it's relatively easy, maybe not for everyone, uh, but for a large majority of users to organize their work in this way. So what does that mean for Condor? So uh, it means that a Condor pool has three sides. It has the submit side um, uh, where users submit their jobs and the submit machine manages uh, all the work and all the jobs that, that come from the users. It obviously has the execute machines. Some people call this the worker nodes where uh, the work actually happens. Uh, and it has a central manager which mitigates, uh, which mitigates the two sides. 
And if you think about the, the users I talked about or the roles I talked about earlier, uh, the submit machine is kind of the domain of the users, the people who have the jobs. Uh, and their wants and needs are really uh, expressed and managed uh, on that side. The execute machines, obviously, uh, are the domain of the owners of the machines, the resource providers. And I think uh, a big philosophical difference between Condor and other systems is we think this split is, is fundamental to the way organizations work. And that is you, you don't have uh, a single homogenous pool with uh, homogenous wants and needs, but rather you have a community of users and that creates a, a community of machines, each of which have maybe different requirements and different wants and needs. Uh, and it's the goal of the system to harmonize these uh, into one federated community. So the first part of our philosophy was to reliably run. Uh, and we take this very seriously. And we believe that um, we can make Condor fast enough uh, without doing too much screw polishing. So that is to say, we want to make Condor fast enough for any size pool that a reasonable organization is going to have, or fast enough to run all the jobs that uh, a reasonable organization may have. We don't try to make it faster than that just for the sake of being it faster, uh, because that will inevitably make it less reliable. So we really want the system to be reliable. Um, and we do a tremendous amount of work to uh, always ensure the reliability of the system as a whole, uh, even if that's the expense of performance in the short term. So for example, um, when we talk about scalability, uh, and I'm not gonna put like absolute numbers on this graph or, or talk about uh, absolute units, but obviously the dream is that you have linear scalability that as you increase load, your performance or maybe your throughput goes up. Uh, and this is always a dream, but this is always uh, achievable only up to a point. Uh, I think we've all seen uh, the reality. Uh, you can think about maybe, uh, maybe in the context of a car, if uh, the performance of a car, say from when it's going from 20 miles an hour to 40 miles an hour, scales linearly in the, in the revolution, in the RPM of the engine, uh, you can't just turn up the RPM of the engine to 10,000 and expect it's going to work. What's going to happen with that or with a lot of computer systems is that you'll scale up for a little bit and then you'll crash. And this is really bad because uh, you end up with uh, a zero performance or, or very poor performance. And I think we've all seen this with machines that have been swapping or uh, machines that have too much work or uh, I'm not going to name names, but are administrator has the sign on his door uh, for uh, overloaded file systems, and I think we've all been there. So something that we work really hard on in Condor, and it's sort of a core part of our philosophy, is this idea that uh, we want to manage uh, our scalability. And that is, well, we'll go up linearly for a while, um, but then there's going to be some resource limit we hit. Maybe it's memory or disk or network or file transfer throughput or, or, or what have you. Uh, and then we want the performance to level off even as load increases. And we tried really hard to have this, this leveling off. We don't always do a perfect job and there's cases we miss, but this is the philosophy and this is the goal. Now you may ask how we do this and there's a number of techniques. We have circuit breakers where we stop accepting more work we do load shedding where we turn off jobs if we've got, we detect we're into an overload system. And obviously, um, instead of accepting work right away, uh, not just for jobs, but for additional things like file transfer and network management, or whatever, we can queue up work um, and defer it to later to smooth out bursts in demand. And like I said, we don't always do a perfect job and this is very hard to do in general, but the philosophy is that we wanna have this performance curve where uh, we don't always go to zero uh, with, with infinite demand. So to reliably run jobs means that um, we believe strongly in, in the Unix model and that uh, to build the system, we build it up of a set of, out of a set of cooperating services. And each of these service is implemented as a Unix process. 
Uh, we also happen to run on Windows. We use processes there. We won't talk about Windows too much in this talk. And the nice thing about Unix processes is they have very clear failure semantics. Um, when you shut it down, the memory, is, uh, the memory is cleared up, file descriptors are closed. It's very clear what happens when you kill a Unix process or even when a Unix process crashes on its own. Because of this, we build our system out of lots of cooperating Unix processes, even on the same machine, so that each process has a very well-defined responsibility. Uh, and we think this is key to the counter philosophy that uh, we are very clear about what service has what responsibilities. And internally, we talk a lot about where responsibility should lie, not necessarily out of a sense of what performs better or what's easier to implement, but we find that when we have this strong idea of uh, what service should have what responsibility, that we build better systems. Now, I said that we deploy Unix processes uh, on, on every machine in our pool. And uh, before we do that, uh, we, we deploy an additional process on every machine that runs a Condor service. And this additional process is the parent process, which we call the Condor master. And the idea is we have a small Unix process called the Condor master, which is responsible for all the other services, all the other Condor services on the machine. Uh, if you're an old Unix person, you might think of this a little bit like init. Uh, if you're a newer, system, a newer Unix person, you might think of it like systemd. So it's responsible for starting um, the rest of the Condor services. It's responding, responsible for restarting them. It's responding, responsible for killing them when asked to. Um, unlike systemd or init, it also works uh, over the network. So you can tell all the Condor masters in your pool to restart or to reread their configuration or to shut down or, or do anything like this. Um, because we wanna be reliable, even perhaps at the cost of performance, uh, another thing the master does is it uh, maintains a keep alive heartbeat to its children. And so it only keeps the children running if uh, it continues to get this heartbeat signal from its fork children. So uh, as long as it thinks it can prove that the child is not just up and running, but also, um, but also um, up and running, but also uh, alive, uh, it will keep them running. If it doesn't detect this, then uh, it will actually kill the child and then restart it. And the master uh, manages um, all these processes. And we have a very specific meaning when we talk about uh, managing. Um, it doesn't just mean to create processes. Um, it also means to uh, remove them uh, when it's time to, to uh, clear out the machine. Uh, and it also means to remove any child or grandchild uh, processes or work that they created too, which actually turns out to be uh, a little bit tricky. More importantly, managing means to measure all the things that have been created and to report it to a, a, a central resource and ideally to limit what you create so we can get this uh, performance curve like we talked about earlier where it flattens off as opposed to going down to zero. Now we want to run, uh, reliably run as many jobs as possible. And this requires the scheduler, uh, as we showed on the left-hand side, which we call the Condor SCEDD. And the users uh, submit jobs uh, to the SCEDD. And because we want this whole process to be reliable, um, it works much like a database. Um, so every job uh, upon submission is written out to uh, a file and that file is synced. And because of that, the state of the SCEDD is a, a little bit slow. Um, but it also means that should the SCEDD or the machine the SCEDD is running on crash, all the jobs are automatically restarted without any user uh, inter intervention. Now, um, to, because it's slow um, and we still wanna run uh, as many jobs as possible, 
that means that we can scale out, we support scaling out by adding many submit points. So instead of trying to make each SCED go uh, as fast as possible, we support, scale, we support horizontal scalability by adding more SCEDDs. Um, and this creates um, one of our mantras we like to speak, we speak of. Um, it allows us to uh, put a submit point near the user. So we can have lots of submit points. Submit points are cheap and easy to create. So we can put a submit point maybe near where the user uh, creates data or generates data. We can put it in their lab and not in a central uh, computing facility. And this uh, allows our mantra, which we call uh, submit locally, run globally. So we allow the user to submit a job um, into their local system and Condor takes care of finding places for it to run maybe on a local system or, or maybe on a more uh, global system than that. But the SCEDD doesn't schedule uh, entirely by itself. I mean, it does a little bit of scheduling. Um, the SCEDD doesn't have all the jobs in the system, um, nor does it have access to uh, all of the machines in the system uh, because we can scale out uh, in this way where we have multiple SCEDDs. Um, the SCEDD can only use the machines that are given to it, uh, and it can ask for more, but if it doesn't get them, it can't do anything with machines it doesn't have. Uh, one of our new system administrators, um, I think in the second week of Condor, said something kind of interesting that I think um, uh, was a very useful way to, to think about Condor. He said that uh, Condor doesn't do scheduling at all, and we were kind of taken aback by this because we, we thought that Condor does scheduling. And we talked to uh, our system administrator for a bit, and what we realized was that um, there's a difference between what we think of as scheduling and planning. And the way we look at things is that scheduling means making decisions right now with uh, all the resources you have in hand. And planning means making decisions in the future about resources or things that you might have in the future. And uh, he said that Condor doesn't do scheduling. And what he really meant was, that Connor doesn't do planning, which is absolutely true. Connor does scheduling. It makes decisions about the here and now, but it doesn't really do much planning. And I think that's another big difference between, um, between Condor and maybe other batch systems, that we focus on, on scheduling and we don't really do much planning. So the SCEDD doesn't really schedule a little bit, and um, it doesn't actually manage the running of the job. It spawns an additional service uh, called the shadow or the Condor shadow to manage each job uh, that when it starts running on the submit machine. Uh, and this shadow is uh, kind of like the old radio play, the shadow, it knows. And it is responsible for um, controlling the policy uh, of a job uh, as it runs. Uh, it tells the worker node what to do, but it's very important for us to have this point of presence, this representation, this running process representation uh, of the job uh, on the worker node. Uh, and this is implemented as a separate process because we want it to be reliable, like we said. Uh, and that process is a little bit expensive, but it's very much worth it. Um, processes tend to be relatively cheap on Linux systems. We frequently have 10 or 20,000 uh, Unix processes running. Uh, typically, when a graduate, new graduate student comes to us, they see this and freak out, and they say, I know, I can make this faster, uh, we'll just use threads here, and we have to have a long conversation about uh, the value uh, of a Linux process. Everyone knows what the cost is, but uh, a lot of people don't know what the value is, and we find that the value of having a separate process for each one of these services outweighs the cost uh, of, the, of the process. Hey, Greg? Greg? Yeah. I got um, someone in the group chat is wants to ask a question here. Yeah, fire away. Uh, it's me, Lauren. So can you explain what you mean by the SCEDD is slow? Like, is that slow by, by what measurements or impacts? Sure. So because the SCEDD is a database and every change to the job is not just stored in memory, but also written to disk, um, it means that we can only have tens of thousands of running jobs uh, in, a, in a particular SCEDD, and that we're not interested 
in supporting millions and millions of running jobs in a particular SCED D. We would rather support millions and millions of running jobs by scaling out and having many independent SCED Ds. Yeah, but is this like slowness that the user would notice? Um, no, it's, it's slowness in terms of scalability that an administrator would notice. Are you with me? Yes. Right. The, and the, the, the philosophical thing here is we're not trying to make one scheduler go as fast as possible. Um, you may run out of capacity in any particular schedule, but the solution to that is to add more schedules. So there's an additional question in the chat of, did you look into using LDAP versus a normal SQL database? Uh, yes. So uh, a lot of the Y4s uh, of Condor uh, are because it was started to be designed 30 years ago. Um, and we, um, when I say Condor, the SCEDD is like a database. It doesn't actually use a SQL database under the hood. Uh, it uses its own proprietary database-like system, which is in a lot of ways similar to a NoSQL database. The schema is extensible. It's a key value store. You can do arbitrary queries on it uh, and things like this. But it is, um, it is an ACID database, so it is reliable. And the important thing here for the administrator is uh, in, in a Condor system, you should never see a message of the day message that says, oops, our scheduler crashed, please resubmit all your jobs. Because the scheduler is a database or has a database, um, everything is reliable and at such time as it restarts, it will, it will uh, keep going from where it was. Does that answer the, the, the question? I'm looking, they, they typed a little more, um, seeing if there's more question inside there. They were acknowledging that LDAP, they understood that LDAP wasn't really intended for this. I think they were focusing on LDAP's ability to do replication. Um, so I, I, I think that must cover it. Right. Uh, I think kind of unlike LDAP, uh, as I understand it, the SCEDD and a lot of NoSQL databases tend to be very write-heavy. So uh, I don't know that most LDAP systems um, uh, are applicable to a very write-heavy load. Uh, any more questions? Um, okay, well, I'll keep going on. These questions are great. Uh, I love them. Uh, so when the scheduler starts running a job, it spawns uh, an additional process, this shadow, that's responsible for running it uh, and implementing the policy uh, on that machine. And we say that we want to run as many jobs as possible on as many machines. So this implies that machines could come from anywhere. They could be uh, not all similar, not all in a local cluster, but they're heterogeneous. There may be some here, some there. They could be in foreign pools. They could be in the same pool, but maybe a, a different configuration. Uh, and most importantly, they could be in places far away that don't share a file system with us. So Condor has to manage, um, uh, and your jobs have to be able to be aware that they can't, um, uh, they can't make a lot of assumptions that the machines they're running on are much like the machines they have now. And that kind of brings up this, this two-faced nature of, of Condor. Uh, we like to talk about split execution, but there's always this split when a job is running between what's going on on the worker side uh, and what's happening on the submit side. And again, this gets back to the, the human nature is that the, the worker machines may be 
owned by or provided by a completely different group or someone with completely different interests than the people submitting the machines. So uh, it's possible, in fact, we encourage the configuration and the policies to be different uh, on each side. And we spent a lot of time focusing on which side is responsible for which policies. And as administrators, we always want to think about where uh, a particular policy should be implemented. A lot of cases, a policy can be implemented both on the Smith side or the execute side, but the choice of where to implement it depends on who really wants that. Is this really an attribute of the job or is it an attribute of the machine? Hey, Greg. So getting, yeah. So it looks like there's a little refinement on the question that we kind of uh, finished. Yeah. Uh, the refinement is you made it clear how the system, the, the SCED-D is handled when it crashes with the database and it recovers. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and so I think the LDAP question, the replication was uh, more beyond just a simple crash. What happens when something goes really wrong on that host? Um, so from an HA standpoint uh, or from a DR kind of standpoint, um, you know, is, is there anything at that side that you're, you're, you're capable of doing with the current setup so that you still don't have to come back and say, you know, the, the machine ate itself, you do have to resubmit today. Um, you know, I think that's the direction he's looking a little more for, or they're looking more for. Gotcha. Uh, so we do have uh, a high availability set up for our SCEDDs, where SCEDDs can be paired. It's very rarely used um, because the SCEDD, uh, the, the only situation you would use this is in some sort of disaster recovery uh, situation like you talk about. But um, we find it's better to have uh, independent SCEDDs uh, and keep your eye on those SCEDDs. Um, in particular, um, especially in CHTC, we look at our, our submit infrastructure as, as somewhat ephemeral. Uh, we don't provide permanent storage on our submit machines. Uh, our policy is that you, you come to us, you, you submit your jobs, you get your work done, you publish your papers, and, and the, the, the cluster is, is not designed for, for permanent storage. Um, does that kind of answer the question? Right, I, I think this is uh, a, a big difference from most batch schedulers that only store their their job information in memory and lose everything on a crash. So yeah, it was confirmed that that answered the question. Right, and and in general, to the degree that you have multiple SCEDDs, multiple independent SCEDDs, the loss of one doesn't cause you to lose your entire system. So, uh, the next service I want to talk about a little is the Start-D, uh, and the Start-D is the service that runs on the worker node on the machine, uh, and it represents the policy of the machine or the machine's owner, uh, and it creates the abstraction of slots uh, with places for jobs to run, and it implements uh, the policy of the machine owner. So, uh, a lot of times there's a conflict between the policy of what the machine wants and the policy of what the job wants. Um, and it's hard coded into Condor that when there is such a conflict with policies, that the machine policy always wins. And our philosophy here is that the job is like a guest on the machine. It's like uh, the, the machine is like an Airbnb that the job is uh, is renting for a bit, um, but that we're always guests, and that the policy of the machine uh, is always higher priority than than the policy uh, of the job. And the role of the Start-D um, is, is to run jobs. Uh, as such, it's a little bit nearsighted. Uh, it doesn't see the whole pool. Uh, when it's considering whether or not to run a job, it really only has three inputs that it's considering. It has the state of the machine, like maybe what else is going on in the machine other than the job, or its load, or its uptime, or the time of day, or things like that. It knows about jobs that it always have running, uh, and it knows potentially, in the case of preemption, uh, about a candidate job that may or may not preempt it, and it has the last say of, of whether or not to enable preemption. But it knows nothing about the rest of the system. So uh, with this, 
The START has its own policy, uh, but it doesn't have a, a global view of the system. The, system, the START can, uh, with this policy, maybe only run some kind of jobs. For example, you could say, uh, I only want to run chemistry jobs. Uh, or it can preempt one job for the other. You say, well, um, I'm here for chemistry and I'll be happy to run physics jobs, but as soon as a physics job is, preempt, is, is presented to me, uh, I'm willing to preempt um, my running jobs for the jobs that I'm, I'm really here for. Um, and it can expose and match custom resources. So it can say, well, I've got this funny new kind of GPU. Uh, I'm happy to have people use it. And these are the, this is what uh, it looks like. But just like the SCEDD <coughs> has a service to help it run the job, the Start D itself doesn't run jobs. Uh, it creates uh, and forks and execs a child process, a, server, a service to do this called the Connor Starter. And while the Start D manages the machine and is responsible for the machine's policy, the Starter manages the job. So that when the job starts, uh, the Start D uh, runs the service, the Starter, to manage the job. There's always one starter process per job uh, and thus one per slot. And the responsibilities of the starter are to manage uh, one running job uh, per starter uh, on each machine. It creates the environment for the job, not just the Unix environment variables, but a scratch directory uh, and manages the sandbox and input and output transfers. It monitors uh, job resources like the CPU and disk and net network. Uh, and like we said before, it cleans up after the job. So the job is like an Airbnb renter, and the starter is responsible for removing any temporary files that the job has created uh, after it exits. Uh, the starter is also responsible for the sandbox transfer of any input files into the job uh, and transfer of the sandbox out after we're done. So I want to talk about file transfer for a little bit. Um, like many batch systems, Condor can use a shared file system to uh, give access to a job's input and the outputs that it creates. But we prefer to have Condor explicitly manage file transfer. And that is to say, in your job description, you say, well, these files are my input files, and they come from here, maybe the local system, maybe from HTTP or here or there, whatever. Um, and the same with uh, the output files. Uh, and we prefer shared, we preferred file transfer, explicit file transfer, um, because it's managed. Um, Condor knows when you have file transfer on what exactly the size of the input, input sandbox is. And when Condor controls that transfer, Condor implements that transfer, then Condor can manage it. So for example, um, Condor will queue up file transfers. So if there's more than a fixed number active, Condor will not initiate any more file transfers because it knows that, or we think that it would overload the machine or the network in that case. And that's again, another way that management provides this, this flattening of the performance curve so we don't have uh, a fall off uh, and a crash. Interestingly, file transfer is also declarative. So an administrator can look at a job and when it declares all its input files, you can see all the input files and then maybe make some monitoring or or interesting uh, decisions or do analytics uh, on the jobs themselves, which can be very valuable. So that's the two uh, sides that you probably know most about, the start D's on the execute side and the sched D's on the Smith side. So let's move on to the final side, the central manager. Uh, and this is the part that um, kind of harmonizes the other two sides. And the central manager comes in two parts, the collector. And the collector acts like a central database. It keeps uh, in memory attributes about all the services, um, but not all the jobs, all the services uh, in the system. And unlike the SCEDD, the collector, because it isn't a central place, is an all-in-memory database. Uh, and thus, it's very lightweight and scalable, and everything reports to it. And everything reports to it um, on a heartbeat uh, or or periodically, uh, and because it's all in memory, uh, it loses everything when it crashes. Now, you may think that that's terrible, but the protocol is that all the services are continually, every few minutes, uh, sending updates, even if they're not asked for one, to the collector. So because of this, if it does crash, it will lose all its active information, but it'll get repopulated very quickly. Um, this also means that 
if a worker node that's sending updates about its state uh, suddenly dies or loses power or the network goes away, um, that it won't send updates to the collector and the collector garbage collects this uh, as it happens uh, if it doesn't get an update after uh, a fixed amount of time. And kind of the interesting thing about this lease protocol is that um, it allows Condor, the distributed system, to make a decision uh, in the absence of information. And this is a very important property that the collector can kind of uh, make decisions and, and heal itself even if it doesn't get a message from the worker node that, hey, uh, I'm going away. Um, the final piece uh, of the central manager uh, is the negotiator. And this does the other half of scheduling. So it talks to uh, the SCED-D. Uh, and in some ways, this is a more deliberate, deliberative, uh, all-encompassing, slower process than the SCED-D because the negotiator has access to and a view of the entire pool. It sees uh, all of the machines in the pool. It sees uh, all of the jobs requests. And the responsibility of the negotiator is to make sure that there's a fair share, for some definition of fair, um, allocation of all the slots in all the machines uh, to the pool. So uh, because of this, we have what we like to think about as a, as a two-phased scheduling process. So every few minutes, usually, the negotiator runs, uh, tries to rebalance the pool, uh, either via preemption if that's enabled, or by assigning out newly uh, idle slots uh, to SCEDDs. Now, once a SCEDD has access to a machine, it's allowed to reuse that machine multiple times for several jobs uh, in sequence, not two jobs at the same time. Uh, and thus, the SCEDD can keep starting jobs on that machine, which we call a claim, uh, multiple times, even if the negotiator has crashed or, or is being restarted. So even though the negotiator and the collector are kind of in the middle, they're not necessarily a central point of failure. You can restart your central manager machine and jobs keep running, new jobs can start, jobs can complete. Now the pool can't be rebalanced and maybe you may not be able to do some of your queries, but it'll come back up without any additional um, any additional work on the part of the administrator. So uh, just to go meta very quickly, we talked about one pool. Condor also has ways to, uh, to federate pools or to move jobs uh, or machines from one pool to another, uh, even if the target pool isn't a Condor pool. Uh, and I'm not going to go into great detail about this, but again, this uh, is sort of part of our point of trying to uh, submit locally and run globally. Maybe globally doesn't mean a big condor pool, maybe it means other condor pools, or maybe it means uh, other pools uh, that aren't even necessarily a, a, a condor pool at all. So summing up, uh, a lot of architectural items to note here. Uh, I'm not gonna read through the slide, um, but I think the important thing is that our policy is distributed uh, because people are distributed. So uh, summing up, uh, I'd like to finish with a quiz. So uh, I'm not gonna ask about like what particular knobs uh, one would do with this, but if you wanna think about if you had a requirement to prevent jobs from running more than a day, um, how would you implement that in this architecture? Or more importantly, where would you implement? Would you implement on the submit machine uh, or on the worker node? And uh, of course, the answer to any, any question uh, uh, of any technical merit is uh, it depends. <coughs> and the real answer is you could do this in either place. Uh, the, you could implement it on the machine or you could implement it on, uh, on, on the worker node or you could implement it on the submit machine. Uh, and the right answer really is it depends on is this one hour limit a property of the job? Is it that you know your job should never take more than a day and if it runs for more than a day, something's gone wrong and you just want to kill it? Or is this a property of the machine where maybe for some policy reasons, for draining or whatever, you never want a job to run for more than a machine, more than a day? Uh, and if so, then that would be a property of the machine. So uh, in summary, you know, people have problems, but also uh, people solve problems. So I hope that maybe um, we can uh, talk about solving some problems now and, uh, and continue with the discussion.
So uh, th th there was a question that got asked a couple minutes ago that I didn't catch quick enough. Um, David asked uh, back about the collector. He says, how is the collector scalable if it's all in memory? Would RAM be a limiting factor? Uh, yes. So memory is a limiting factor of the collector. Now, the interesting thing about the collector is it doesn't store every job, but it does store information about every machine. Uh, and it stores a, a few K, uh, maybe 10 kilobytes for every machine. And sort of our assumption is if you can afford, I don't know, a few thousand dollars for a machine, uh, for every thousands of dollars of machine, uh, of money that you can afford for a machine, you ought to be able to buy uh, 10K worth of memory for your central manager. So for example, the largest pools today uh, are the, the CMS Global Pool, which is pushing, I think, 350,000 cores. Um, and that still easily fits within a single central manager. So another question is, if you'll briefly describe the complications that there are any with submitting jobs to Windows machines. Uh, sure. So um, with a Condor pool, because it can be heterogeneous, you can have uh, Windows machines that execute nodes in your pool. You can have Windows nodes as submit machines in your pool. Uh, and you can have uh, a mixture of both. Um, because of our process architecture, processes tend to be much more expensive on Windows and Linux. So the submit side scalability is uh, significantly less on Windows than it is uh, on Linux. So we have several commercial users with large Windows pools, uh, and frequently they have uh, Linux submit machines to, or especially Linux central managers, to be more scalable. Uh, but other than that, this all works on Windows. I would say, uh, whereas a Linux machine can have tens of thousands, of running jobs per submit machine. A Windows submit machine may have like a thousand running jobs before you need to add SCEDDs. Uh, and that would be the big, uh, the, the big limit on, on Windows. Uh, perhaps another thing we see, which is sort of independent of Condor, is that um, obviously in a batch scheduling system, it only schedules batch jobs and batch jobs can't uh, talk to the console or open windows or, or you know, ask for a mouse click from the mouse or something like that. And uh, a lot of Windows programs aren't necessarily batch friendly out of the box. Uh, and that's one of our, our bigger challenges when, when dealing with Windows pools is, is the jobs themselves. Are there other questions anybody has for Greg? Uh, feel free to type them out in chat, uh, unmute yourself, uh, vocally ask them, however. Okay, so Clifford has a question. Um, does Condor integrate easily with other schedulers like Slurm? Uh, yes, uh, and that sort of gets to one of the later slides I talked about where we want to uh, be able to federate uh, mini pools together, even if they're not running uh, Condor. So for example, at Wisconsin, uh, we have a Slurm pool uh, to manage our HPC resources. 
and we backfill our slurm pool with Condor jobs. Uh, and the way we do this is um, we have Condor services running on the slurm worker nodes, and um, we treat slurm like the owner of the machine. So when slurm is running a job on a node, uh, it tells Condor, hey, uh, if you're running a job, stop running jobs, kick them off right away. And when slurm stops running a job, uh, it tells Condor, okay, uh, I'm free now. Or the machine is free for you to use now. Uh, you can use it until such time as, as, as I kick it off. Uh, that, that's one way. Um, there are other ways uh, with what we call the grid universe, where it's possible to send jobs, to route jobs from a Condor scheduler and send it to a Slurm scheduler. In that case, Slurm knows about the job and schedules it with its, its uh, scheduling algorithms. Um, and there's a, a very tricky way called Glide-in, which could be used as well. So one thing with, with high throughput in general that we're very eager to do is to be able to access all the resources on campus, uh, even, if they're, even if they're hidden behind another scheduler. Isn't this also how Open Science Grid approaches a lot of their um, integration with existing systems? Yes. So uh, with Open Science Grids, um, they have kind of a two-phased uh, approach. And the general idea behind the Open Science Grid is to build an over, a virtual overlay pool uh, out of all the existing campuses that are in the Open Science Grid. So the Open Science Grid is composed of, well, I can't keep track anymore, over 100 campuses, uh, and they run all kinds of different schedulers. But what the OSG does is the Unix processes that implement these worker node services uh, are submitted to these local batch systems, be they running Slurm or LSF or Grid Engine or, or what have you. Uh, and when those local batch systems, based on their own policy, decide to run those jobs, they become uh, a worker node in this overlay, what we call a Glidin pool. Um, so that way, the local users can always have priority. And when they have local work to do, they submit it to their local scheduler in the same way they always have. Uh, but should those machines, should those pools be idle, uh, the Open Science Grid is allowed to uh, start their jobs, which form this overlay pool. Hey, Greg, I could show, it looks like maybe somebody would be interested, the diagrams of our campus ecosystem. Yeah, I think that'd be great. Okay, somebody will have to let me screen share. So I'm Lauren Michael, I'm the lead research computing facilitator at the Center for High Throughput Computing, which has one mission, developing distributed computing technologies for decades like Condor, but we're also UW-Madison's research computing, like core research computing center on campus. Uh, let's see. You, should, you should be able to share now, Lauren. Great, okay. While, while you're getting that set up, Greg, I was gonna ask about your slides. Uh, if we could uh, get a link to them if possible so that we could uh, include that with the notes from today. Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, this is just an introduction to our center uh, presentation. So I've got a few slides here. So we have a condor pool that I'm showing in red um, that has a variety of, of different computing hardware. Basically, we have users submit to our condor pool for any job that runs on a single server or less. And there are a lot of single core jobs because condor can scale really well for that. So a single user with single core jobs can have hundreds of cores in use just for them. Um, within a few hours after submitting. So our Condor pool has around, I don't know, somewhere between 12 and 16,000 cores. And I, it varies a lot in part because we use Condor to backfill our Slurm cluster, which is the gray part where I say MPI. And we basically have users only use that computing system if they truly have multi-node jobs that are frequently using MPI to run across multiple nodes. They submit via Slurm and then what we, what we do is we have Slurm turn Condor on or off on each machine based upon whether Slurm is using that machine for a Slurm submitted job. So the number of machines or slots um, cores in our Condor pool varies because it's sort of breathing in and out of our HPC cluster as we call it. 
But that HPC cluster, as you can see, is, is quite a bit smaller. We only need that special configuration with expensive interconnects um, and shared file system across everything for people who need to run multi-node jobs. And then we can scale really well for lots of little jobs, which is the vast majority of what researchers are walking in with. And then our pool is one of many condor pools on campus. So on our campus, in terms of socialization, rather than trying to force everybody to centralize and bring their research computing resources into our pool, Condor allows us to work with other organizations on campus, like IceCube, which is nationally headquartered here. And so they run computing for not just UW-Madison researchers, but researchers everywhere. They have a good justification for running their own compute system. But our users and their users can add a flag to their jobs that allow their jobs to run not just in the pool that their SCED-D is directly associated with, but for the SCED-D to communicate jobs out to the other pools by communicating to those central managers. So the, the right arrow is meant to represent that, that jobs can move fluidly between pools in what we call a, a grid, sort of the classical definition of grid computing. Um, so uh, additionally, one of the pools that our users' jobs can go to is the open science grid, where we're one of, like Greg mentioned, over 100 campuses that contribute resources um, uh, one of those pools could also be the cloud. So researchers submitting at one of our SCEDDs can communicate to Condor a special request that says, go out to Amazon, um, here's sort of a credential key, um, and get me this type of resource, add it to my local Condor pool, um, and only run my jobs that are flagged like this. And if I run out of jobs or any of those instances are inactive for more than this amount of time, shut them all down. And so this gives our users the ability to submit in one place and really run in, in many different compute environments. We have a large number of researchers who are continuously running across not just what we own, but other pools on our campus and the open science grid. Um, and so of the you know, 400 million or so hours that we served in the last year, roughly half of those are on hardware we don't own. And individual researchers can use many millions of compute hours. And it's very inexpensive for us. So if there are any questions about all of that, I'm happy to answer. Hi, Laura. This is Clifford. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, I do have a quick question. So when people are submitting jobs that may go to other resources that are not part of your central um, compute, yep. uh, how does that, how does, how does the file interaction happen with that? Ah, so Condor, um, in its default mode, transfers files specified by the user to the execute servers. So across our local pool even, and most of the other pools on our campus, there isn't like a single shared file system across an individual pool. The home directories are not in a shared file system. The jobs don't run within a shared file system. Rather, users submit from home directories, which in our case are local disk on the, on the submit servers. And then Condor is transferring files and borrows disk space as part of the job request to create a working directory that the user's job runs within. Now, when we have users who have really large data that doesn't make sense to be schlepping that far, they stay mm -hmm. in the local CHTC pool and we have what is effectively kind of a shared file system that's just for staging those really large files. And so, and is that something where the users know that if they have large things, they shouldn't be submitting it elsewhere or? Right, so um, we have, for example, an online guide that I can drop into um, the chat that makes this really clear. And our policies page specifically talks about the fact that um, file sizes may matter. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, I think also, an important part of this configuration that we should share is that uh, this going out to the bigger pools doesn't happen by default. The user has to ask explicitly uh, that they're going out to the OSG or the other pools and th there's a conversation that happens with RCFs that explains the, the, the benefits and additional responsibilities that the jobs have and get uh, when you make that choice. Well, quick question. Um, how is user authentication handled? Like if you're going across to different pools, different places, 
uh, how do they get accounts and stuff. So one of the benefits of this, this file transfer uh, thing that we've been talking about is that uh, if you're not writing to a shared file system, then the job can run with any operating system identity that, that exists on the system. So frequently, um, there'll be a distinct Unix user ID per slot that the job runs as, that it creates its scratch files as, and that, the, and that when the job is finished and Condor transfers the files back, only when they're transferred back to the submit machine uh, do they have the identity uh, of that user. So you don't need to have a, a global namespace uh, for all of your users on all of your execute machines if you don't have a shared file system. Right, and in practice on CHTC, our users' jobs run as themselves, as their Unix um, identity, when they're running in our pool, but when they go run in somebody else's pool, they're running as you know some generic slot user just for that job, just on that machine. Got it, thank you. All right, well, we're at the top of the hour. Are there any uh, last minute uh, questions you'd like to throw out before we uh, thank uh, Greg and uh, Lauren for the content they've shared with us and adjourn our meeting? Well, in, in lieu of any other questions, we really appreciate your time, Greg, and, and help putting this together, Lauren, and the things you added at the end. And thank everybody for uh, their participation and attendance. So we'll call today's meeting done. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, all. <laughs>